Chancellor and the Registrar of RGOHS, I welcome all of you for this continued medical education webinar on COVID-19 organized by Rajiv Gandhi University of Health Sciences. Today's speaker is Dr. Mahesh Kotpalli. Uh, without wasting much time, I invite, I request our Honorable Vice Chancellor to kindly provide his opening remarks. Thank you, Dr. Mahendra. Uh, in pursuit of the continuation of the continued medical education program uh, as a part of the second uh, wave of COVID, uh, we are now at uh, crossroads. The case, case load and total uh, positive rate is all coming down. That's a good sign. But I'll be some uh, districts which are still showing a higher positivity rate. Uh, by and large, the uh, total positive case, case load is all coming down to uh, you know uh, lesser than what it was in the earlier uh, uh, time at this point of time. But nevertheless, we should not let our guard down. That is what is the uh, message that everybody, uh, everyone dealing with COVID-19 wants to convey. The difference between first and second wave was, you know, the second wave uh, uh, there is, saw unprecedented uh, uh, occurrence of uh, fungal infections, especially mucormycosis, which was not, it was there in the first, uh, I'm told that clinicians did see some cases, but it was not in that proportion. And now probably this has uh, assumed epidemic proportions. And in India, more than 30,000 cases are being reported with around more than two, two and a half thousand in Karnataka itself. So uh, all of us know that mucormycosis is a uh, fungal infection, invasive fungal infection, which uh, occurs not in a you know, healthy individual, but in individuals who have got compromised uh, immuno, immunosuppressive condition or uh, uh, they are on some uh, immunosuppressive drugs or steroids, or basically they have diabetes or whatever. So uh, the factor that we need to fear, fear about uh, mucormycosis is that it has got very high mortality. So the patients can be saved when there is high index of suspicion of such cases when they are recognized much earlier and then later on treated with uh, appropriate drugs. We also had the uh, government of uh, uh, you know India and also Karnataka went through very well, uh, difficult phases when we ran out of supply of uh, the drug which is essential to treat uh, mycormycosis, amputacin B. Thanks to the quick action uh, taken by government of India, now it's all uh, you know uh, the production has been increased then the drug can be imported from uh, outside uh, India. And then they, uh, you know, it's now freely available. Uh, of course, it is uh, only uh, issued on, uh, uh, you know, patients and other details are entered. So with that, the situation has improved. Early diagnosis, early uh, thing would definitely make a uh, impact and also uh, treat the patients much earlier itself. And that would definitely go a long way in reducing the mortality and morbidity of the sky. Today we have with us uh, Dr. Mahesh Kotpali, a uh, well-known infectious disease uh, uh, specialist. He, he was with us a few weeks ago as well. And uh, he's expertise in handling such cases in uh, US. He would like to share today. And on behalf of Rajiv Gandhi University of I welcome you, Dr. Mahesh. And uh, uh, you know this would definitely uh, give us an insight into how uh, mycosis can be handled, whether we have to go to the source of the uh, infection, whether we have to find out whether it's a nosocomial infection, and uh, uh, later on uh, treat accordingly. So that is what uh, will be discussed today, because this topic is relevant and uh, will uh, you know be of much important to all the treating uh, clinicians, especially those who are in uh, intensive care units and uh, uh, medical colleges. And we'll, uh, we'll listen to Dr. Mahesh Kotpali. Thank you so much, uh, Mahendra, over to you. Dr. Dayanand, kindly start the proceedings. Professor Dayanand? Uh, Hello, Mahendra? Please start the proceedings, uh, Doctor. Yes, yes. OK. Dr. Ah, tell me, Mahindra. Hello. Please invite Dr. Mahesh Kotpalli to start the proceedings. Ah, okay. Um, good afternoon, everybody. I invite today's speaker, Dr. Mahesh Kotpalli. 
Uh, over to Dr. Mahesh Kotapalli, sir. Sir, please start. Good afternoon, everyone. Good Thank afternoon. you, Vishesh, sir, again. Uh, good seeing you. Um, I was here uh, when the pandemic started again. So I'm revisiting uh, because of the, not only the mucor, but uh, also we've seen a lot of uh, multi-drug resistant bacteria creep into the hospitals and uh, it's, it's become a nuisance, uh, actually. Um, so um, I'm going to talk about mucor. This is mostly everybody knows about it. It's in the literature. I'm not going to tell you anything new, uh, but uh, we can have a healthy discussion and can have a a brainstorm as to why we're seeing this during this epidemic right now. Um, and why, why is it that we didn't see much before and why we're seeing now? Um, so having said that, let me go ahead and start. Uh, so this, my first experience with mucormycosis was um, in 2003 when I was a, a, a how do you say, a fellowship, also known as super specialty PG at that time. Uh, uh, 2003 was my first year of, of PGY4, I would say, 2003 is uh, after my intern, internal medicine residency, I was in infectious disease fellowship. Uh, so I got a um, phone call at around two o'clock in the night uh, where I had to rush to the hospital and uh, this is what we found. Um, so this is, this is, I want to start off with a case. Um, you know, most of you have heard of mycosis. But I don't know how many of you in the you know um, group today have actually seen one live. Uh, so we're going to start off with the case and how it presented to us and what we did, and then we'll talk a little bit about the mucor. So this is about a 20-year-old Hispanic female. Hispanic means Spanish. Uh, he was admitted uh, for cellulitis of left eye, uh, and as you can see, November 12, 2008, um, and uh, a few days prior to his admission patient apparently slipped and fell and might have injured his left eye. And the workup at the South Shore Hospital, that's the name of the hospital, it was negative. Pretty much uh, standard cellulitis was diagnosis. Slight cellulitis was noted the next day and was advised to apply warm compress and was discharged. The left eye cellulitis progressively worsened and the patient went back to the same South Shore Hospital and now it was noted to be in DKA. So therefore he was admitted to the ICU and treated. Uh, patient's family was told that his, this cellulitis cannot be helped here in this hospital and the prognosis was poor because South Shore Hospital is a smaller hospital. So the family immediately signed him out against medical advice and brought him to Mount Sinai Medical Center, which is where I was a, a trainee. Um, that's a, a tertiary hospital, it's a bigger hospital. Upon arrival to our ER, patient was awake and alert to a point that he knew he was thirsty, but he could not provide any other information because he was a little confused. So the history was obtained from the family at bedside. During his stay in the emergency room, his left eye progressed rapidly and now became a periorbital edema with pustules at the glabella and loss of vision in the left eye for 24 hours. He was initially started on subtriaxone and ID was called, ID is infectious disease, so I was called and we went and saw the patient. And when I saw the patient, this is what I noticed. His left eye was kind of stable, wasn't moving. There was conjunctivitis, hemorrhagic conjunctivitis. And we saw these little pustules here in the gabella area. And then that's a close up shot. And then when you look from the side view, you can see the bulging of the conjunctivi here and serous drainage. And you can see the ecchymosis of the entire face over here on the left side. And then a closer examination of the eye. This is what the eye looked like, uh, hemorrhagic conjunctivitis. And then again, you can see all this erythema around the orbital area. And then this was day two. By this time, he was in respiratory failure, DKA. So they intubated him, started him on the insulin drip. And as you can see, initially it was the left eye. And by day two, it started crossing the midline, going to the right side, and you started seeing necrotic lesions here all over in the forehead and the ecchymosis was spreading. This is day five. 
And then by the time we took a biopsy and then sent it out to the microbiology and we got a phone call that it was growing something. This here in the center is a water vapor. So don't look at this, look at this at 12 o'clock position here. This, this is what was growing on the culture. And then we did a microscopic examination and this is what was revealed. I can see the spores here and the shaft and the classic telltale sign of mucor is the root. This is the uh, yeast or mold that has this classic presentation. When you see a root from the stem coming up, you know, that's classic for mucor. So that was our case. And having said that, we're gonna start uh, talking about mucor. The term mucormycosis was used for years, then supplanted by the word zygomycosis for several decades. And based on molecular studies, mucormycosis again is the current nomenclature we use um, currently. It's caused by these fungi, the three fungi that cause mucormycosis is a condition. Mucormycosis is a condition caused by any of these three fungi. Rhizophus, mucor, or rhizomucor. Um, this uh, is more of a mold uh, rather than a fungus. And this is ubiquitous in nature in the sense it's like God, it's everywhere. We are breathing spores in and out as we speak along with the same like aspergillus, any other molds. Um, it's usually found in decaying vegetation and soil. It grows rapidly and releases a large number of spores. And these spores get airborne and we inhale them. And then it's very common in the environment and uh, a relatively frequent contaminant in micro labs. Just because it's growing in a micro lab, it doesn't mean it's true. And it could be a contamination because it's everywhere. The spores are everywhere. Rare human infection is seen because we have intact immune system. So because of an intact immune system, we don't see this every day. It, we breathe it. I'm sure we all breathe it every day. And then we just, it just gets destroyed. It just doesn't hurt us in any way. It only occurs in the presence of immune dysfunction of some sort or the other. Microbiology, the hyphae are broad. You can see the hyphae under microscopy here. Irregularly branched and have rare septations. Now here, contrast aspergillus, you have narrower compared to this one, which is broader here. And clinical specimen should not be grinded, but minced, you know, in order to get effective growth uh, as because the septate are very fragile. If you grind it, they just get destroyed. So you mince it and then you, you send it for culture. Rhizophus, which is also a class of the mucormycosis has an enzyme called ketone reductase. This allows them to thrive in high glucose and high acidic conditions. Rhino, orbital, cerebral, and pulmonary mucormycosis are the most common forms, and these occur because of inhalation. You inhale it, it goes into your nose from there. It goes up higher and higher uh, from the nose to the sinuses, sinus to the orbit, uh, et cetera, and to the brain, finally. Um, healthy individuals, we all have cilia, which is healthy and transport these pores to the pharynx when you inhale them. And we usually we let, <clears throat> and we spit it out or it goes into our stomach and the acid in our stomach kills it. So that's pretty much in healthy individuals. Um, in immune compromised individuals, infection starts in the nasal turbines or the alveoli. Now, the hallmark of this fungi is it's angioinvasive. It infects the blood vessels. And that's why you see the dark necrosis. Uh, of the infected site. This is a classic finding for mucor because it's an angio-invasive. Now, one of the theories is that um, that's floating around during the COVID time is a um, lot of people have been putting in WhatsApp groups that inhale steam 10 times a day, 20 times a day, as much inhale steam, inhale steam, that's all that's going on. So maybe these individuals inhale steam like crazy and maybe the cilia got damaged. And that's one of the theories that's floating around. Uh, we don't have enough studies to prove that. That's one of the theories that I'm also kind of looking at and saying, hmm, why didn't we see that in US? Because they didn't inhale steam. Maybe in India, these guys are inhaling more steam than US. Maybe that's why it's happening. I don't know. Most likely that's one of the debated questions. The, the medication, uh, defiroxamine, uh, we used in iron overload. And that chelates iron and alumin uh, uh, aluminum 
and it's excreted and used especially in renal failure patients and uh, sickle cell patients or other patients who have multiple blood transfusions whereby it causes iron overload and use this medication, deferoxamine. The, the deferoxamine iron chelate, the compound is called ferroxamine and it is a sedrophore. Sedrophore pretty much means opening the door uh, for the uh, fungus to take in more iron and it so rhizopus thrives in presence of high iron levels. So uh, the fungus, it takes more iron and then it grows more rapidly and it causes tissue invasion. And then it, from there it can be disseminated disease and become fatal. Iron overload may predispose to mucormycosis. And that's very interesting uh, thing that we are seeing in COVID situations. Diabetic ketoacidosis also known as DKA, elevated concentration of free iron in their serum and uh, acidic pH. These are the three more components that uh, aid in the growth of uh, rhizopus. What are the risk factor for mucormycosis? Uncontrolled diabetes mellitus, use of glucocorticoids, hematologic malignancies, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, solid organ transplantation, the use of deferoxamine in iron overload patients, the iron overload itself, HIV AIDS, IV drug abuse, trauma and burns and malnutrition. What is the epidemiology? It's not very common. Um, about 929 cases reviewed that were presented between this and in over 60 years that so many cases were reviewed and reported. Most of them predominantly had diabetic patients, 36%. Um, most of these patients had rhinocerebral infection, just like the patient I, sh I showed you earlier. Um, the decline in USA was attributed to use of statins due to inhibitory effect on growth of mucormycosis in vitro. The hematologic malignancies, 17% were attributed at, and uh, hematic hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, graft versus host disease. And then in, in there some of these Transplant patients, voriconazole is given as a prophylaxis, especially if they have uh, um, HSV uh, recurrent coming on, uh, herpes virus. Uh, they put them on voriconazole, uh, not address, I'm sorry, I didn't say HSV, fungal infections, voriconazole is antifungal. Uh, and in those patients, transplant patients, they are prone to fungal infections, therefore they put them on voriconazole. So voriconazole has no effect on uh, mucormycosis, so it kills other fungus, you know, your candida, candida glabrata, uh, and candida parapsalosis, and you have your aspergillosis. All this is killed by voriconazole, thereby making room for mucormycosis unopposed growth. So that's one of the uh, things they found. And then patients who take immunosuppressive agents, especially the transplant patients, uh, they are all on some kind of immune suppression. Uh, therefore, uh, that was also aiding in the growth of this thing. Again, solid organ transplant, it was lesser compared to hematologic malignancies. Uh, as, um, again, that we, we talked about, you know, overuse of voriconazole and Casper function. Now, healthcare associate, uh, hospital acquired, so in solid organ transplant patients and diabetes mellitus, severe prematurity in babies who were born premature, uh, skin uh, and was a common site of infection and followed by gastrointestinal mucormycosis was also noted. Source of entry in these healthcare associated was the surgical entry site. Um, invasive catheters uh, like trapped, uh, central lines or regular IV lines, adhesive tape and bandages and wooden tongue depressors, uh, especially if the, the, uh, there's construction going on in the hospital uh, on one side, you know, the dust that comes out of it, that was also aiding in healthcare associated mucormycosis. And some of the hospital linen uh, that were not cleaned properly was also the source of this infection. Um, natural disasters, um, tornadoes. Um, tornadoes are the world ones that goes in, in circle and they do a lot of damage and destruction. Um, and uh, when a tornado comes on, uh, if your house is made of uh, wood, your house will be completely lifted and destroyed. At the same time, a lot of dust uh, comes on. Tornadoes typically happen in flat surfaces, flat grounds, 
so a lot of dust comes up and along with that and that also causes an increase in the mucor because it's found in soil and in tornadoes these wooden chips come and hit the people and they get penetrating traumas from that and along with that the mucor enters those uh, wounds and you've seen cutaneous mucor mycosis in those things combat associated uh, military personnel blast injuries uh, especially if they're going on a uh, foot patrol, uh, those grenades or uh, those uh, landmines blast off and these people get these infections as well. Uh, what happened in COVID? Um, predominantly most of the, uh, the, how do you say, the cases that were reported were of uh, rhino, cerebral and pulmonary. Well, one of the causes uh, are steroids, use of uh, toclizumab and uh, other uh, new maps that came out into the market. These, guys, these pretty much wipe up your immunity. Because your immunity is wiped out uh, for a short period of time, you are, again, prone to this thing, and these are seen in, the, uh, in patients. Uncontrolled blood sugars. Now, the question was, well, what happened the first round? I'm going to spend a little time here before we move on, uh, because I think this is what everybody's interested in. Uh, what happened the first round, and why what's happening more on the second round? The first round, nobody knew how to treat COVID. And uh, we were using steroids, but we were afraid to use high dose steroids at that time. You know, that study didn't come out on that dexamethasone study. So steroids were given, but a little smaller doses were being given. Maybe that's why we didn't see it around the first round. Second round, we were giving high doses of steroids because of whatever experience we had around the first time. As soon as patients were getting infected, patients were getting steroids, even at home. Uh, prednisone was being prescribed left, right, and center, and patients were in the ICU were giving heavy doses of steroids. What happens when you give steroids? Your blood sugars are uncontrolled. They go high. Well, why didn't we see that in Western countries? Well, in the Western countries, the blood sugars are monitored to the T very carefully. They have protocols for that. Um, as soon as the patient, every two hours, they do a blood glucose level. And if, if and then they constantly, they have an insulin sliding scale and they keep giving insulin to get the blood sugars under control. And they have monitors to kind of tell you where the sugars are, continues to be monitored. So the monitor is telling you if the sugars go up, they put them on insulin drip. So there, the insulin are, protocols are pretty strictly followed and the nursing staff is so well trained. They don't even have to call the doctor. They give you a protocol and the protocol is for if the blood sugar is between uh, 200 to 300, then you give four units. If it's more than that, you give six units. If it's more than that, you give, it's all written down for them. So they just follow the protocol and the insulin uh, is used and sugars are controlled very well. The question is that being done in this country with such high regulation, um, I don't know the answer. Um, the hospital that I'm consulting at, we have introduced the protocols and we haven't seen any mucormycosis. Even though it's a huge hospital, we haven't seen mucormycosis in this. And that could be one of the reasons you're seeing in other places, maybe they're not monitoring the blood sugars properly or not aware that's supposed to be monitored or they don't have protocols. And you do understand doctors are afraid to go inside. And most of the time it's the ancillary staff and the nursing staff inside the wards. And maybe if they are not educated and they don't have protocols in place, they don't know how to give proper insulin uh, levels and check with blood sugar levels. Is that is all happening? Is that why we're seeing more in this country than Western countries? That's one question up for debate. So next is acidic pH. <clears throat> if you noticed, all these COVID patients who are coming in into ICU or non-ICU and they're in respiratory distress and they are based on BiPAP or ventilators. How many of them are getting a regular ABG, arterial blood gas? That's the only way you can check for a pH. So I've noticed that it's not happening. I have not seen an ABG being done on a regular basis, on a daily basis, or sometimes two, three times if needed. Until we initiated a protocol in the hospital and every patient who is in respiratory distress, we do an ABG and based on ABG, pH and PCO2 and the PO2 levels, a decision is made to intubate. Once the patient is intubated, uh, within a few minutes, 
Another ABG is done to see the improvement. And then every four hours or every six hours, an ABG is done. And then if you see an acidic pH, and a pH, normal human pH is 7.47. And anything less than that is acidic more than is uh, elevated uh, bicarb. But most of them I've seen is in respiratory distress arts between 7.1 to 7.2, you see a lot. And how many of us are aggressively looking, doing ABGs, looking at ABGs, interpreting the ABG, and then treating that acidity? How many of us are actually pushing bicarb like vial after vial after push, push, push bicarb drip, and then put them on bicarb drip and bringing that uh, acidic pH uh, up to normal? How many actually are doing it um, and how many are not doing it? So since we are not doing it, I mean, you have to understand doing an ABG is expensive and every few hours, it's a lot of money. Uh, so it's, it's frowned upon in uh, certain institutions to do so many ABGs and uh, not every hospital has an ABG available. Uh, there are some nursing homes that don't have an ABG machine. I don't know if they have it or not. Uh, are they able to do it every very frequently to look the acid balance and see if that's been corrected aggressively or not? Is that the reason why we are seeing more mucormycosis in this round around? Now, elevate, if you notice that all these COVID patients, we are checking on LDH, CDAC2 protein and ferritin levels. And if you notice, ferritin levels are elevated constantly in these patients who are in severe COVID. So what did I say earlier? We just discussed that iron overload in, in the serum, too much iron in the serum, it favors the growth of the mucor because it takes it in and it tries to grow in that thing. So is, is that something related to COVID causing elevated ferritin levels uh, because of the inflammation, thereby promoting the growth of mucormycosis? This is a very interesting theory uh, based on what I told you earlier. Um, in presence of high iron levels, it grows very well. Um, if anyone's interested, maybe a PG or a few PGs can get together, collect data on all these patients where um, mucor was noted and, and put all the data and look at all the labs and see if indeed these ferritin levels were significantly higher in these patients and what medications were they on and what was the acid base uh, levels in these patients if they were intubated. And that is the only way we can come to a conclusive answer and say, yes, this is what happened. This is what was found. And that's why this happened. Unless we have a proper study done at a national level, uh, this should be mostly encouraged by the government. Funds should be provided by the government for these, uh, uh, you know, interested parties to conduct this study, then we won't have an answer. And, and everything would be speculation. You know, I just speculated the heck out of all these things. I speculated on steroids, I speculated on toclizumab, I speculated on acid-base balance, we speculated on ferritin levels. This is all speculation. A lot of speculations happening. Definitive answers could be all of the above or none of the above. No one knows unless a study is conducted. This is, this is this is not an, uh, a progressive study, it's a retrospective study. That means you can go back, call those hospitals, wherever the case was, see if they can share the data with you without sharing the name of the patients, and then collect the data, look at it, and publish a paper. That's an excellent study to be done for any of the postgraduates interested uh, for the doctorate. Now, the last one, remember I told you about overusage of steam inhalation? Uh, which could be causing damage to the nasopharyngeal cilia. And this, again, I'm talking about the patients who are not inpatient, they're mostly ambulatory and they're outpatient in their homes. Um, and those, some of those patients apparently got mucormycosis, haven't seen one. Um, and again, I haven't seen one in Bangalore uh, where I, I, I practice from time to time. Uh, but this is all from what I'm hearing. Uh, from colleagues and in the papers that patients who are not admitted are also getting this mucor. Is it because they're doing too much steam inhalation, thereby damaging their nasopharyngeal cilia, and it's not clearing the fungus uh, out like it does in a normal individual? Um, again, these are all my theories and 
and there's no data on this one. Again, this is just based on literature, what we have. We know that steroid stoclizumab, other maps that suppress the immunity, you know, in immune suppression, you get uh, mucormycosis. Uncontrolled blood sugars, diabetic ketoacidosis, yes, it causes mucormycosis. Acid, it, low acid is very good for the muco to grow because of these patients who are respiratory failure, they have respiratory acidosis or metabolic acidosis. Is this being addressed and corrective aggressively? Um, or was this missed altogether or not being looked at aggressively? Uh, elevated iron levels, so in steam. These are again, points to be discussed and looked into as we go forward uh, with COVID associated mucormycosis. What are the clinical presentations? This is classic. Um, this is kind of looks like my patient, and this is another one that has eroded all the way into the uh, sinuses and the facial bones. And this is again showing uh, early stages of invasion of the uh, nasal turbines and coming up to the surface. Uh, this is necrotic uh, late stages again. This is already, remember I told you it's an angio-invasive, invades the blood vessels, therefore the tissue dies off. Um, infarction and necrosis of host tissues from angioinvasive nature of the hyphae. This is classic. Uh, rhinocerebral mucormycosis, inhalation of spores, hyperglycemia, acidosis, and ketoacidosis are the causes for this. What are the symptoms? Um, the symptoms that you see is uh, sinusitis, uh, fever, nasal congestion, purulent nasal discharge, headache, sinus pain. Usually, all sinuses are involved. Um, rapid spread to the palate uh, and the orbit and the brain. Here's a picture showing the, the palate is involved in necrotic palate. And you can also see nasal ulcers in this particular patient. Uh, this is a hallmark. If you look at something like that, it's highly suspicious for mucormycosis. You immediately call ENT and have them take it to the OR for debridement. Uh, nasal ulceration, destruction of nasal turbinates and uh, perinasal swelling erythema and sinuses of the overlying facial skin, like I just showed you in the earlier picture. Orbital involvement, periorbital edema, proptosis, blindness, and ophthalmoplegia. Um, I showed that on my first case when I presented, if you remember. Facial numbness. Uh, this is from impaction of the sensory branches of the fifth cranial nerve. It invades the nerve area. And then it infects the ethmoid sinus. From the ethmoid sinus, it goes to the frontal lobe. And once it touches the frontal lobe, uptendation is noted. The patients are not responsive anymore. Um, sphenoid, sorry. Sphenoid sinus, uh, from there it goes to the coveredness sinus, and then it leads to covered nice sinus thrombosis. And once you see that, you can, if you, if you do an MRI and you see the coveredness sinus thrombosis, you will never forget that. And that will lead to cranial nerve palsies. And God forbid, if the carotid artery is involved, then it's goodbye. It's pretty much done. Pulmonary mucormycosis. Um, it's again, a rapidly progressive disease. Um, inhalation of the spores into the bronchioles and the alveoli is how the entry happens. Um, pneumonia with infarction and necrosis is seen. Uh, this is another x-ray here. You can actually see invasion over here on the left uh, upper lobe. It spreads to the mediastinum and the heart and hematogenous dissemination to other organs. Once it comes into the heart, it spreads everywhere else. Uh, what are the classic symptoms of pulmonary um, mucormycosis is hemoptysis. And uh, what are the underlying conditions? Usually you see then hematologic malignancies, use of steroids, defaroxamine, and solid organ transplant patients. Here's a CT scan again showing uh, uh, the fungus uh, invasion of here of the lung. And this is a uh, microscopic showing the cerebrospores. Now, another one called GI mucormycosis, gastrointestinal invasion. Very rare. It's usually seen in premature kids. Uh, it happens from ingestion of spores. Uh, you see in diabetic solid organ transplant patients and abuse uh, symptoms, usually abdominal pain, hematemesis, uh, GI lesions are necrotic ulcers and perforation and peritonitis is seen. You can see here this whole GI is necrosis here. 
in this particular uh, uh, CT finding, you can actually see the, uh, the affected area. And then this is again, this is what you're seeing over here, same patient. Uh, bowel infarctions happen and hemorrhagic shock happens and then prognosis is very poor in these situations. Cutaneous mucormycosis. It's rare. Again, same culprits, diabetes, organ transplantation, neutropenia, and prematurity. Inoculation of the spores into the dermis. How did they get there? Usually trauma, wounds, intravenous catheters, insulin injection sites, dressings and splints, burns, and surgical sites. Um, this is, again, a classic. And then you can see the pathology here. This is the uh, the fungus, the mucor fungus at right angle branches. This is classic finding. Again, you might see initial stages here like this one or an advanced necrotic stages like this one. Diagnosis. Tissue histopathology and rarely culture confirmation. Invasive testing is a must. Um, when I say that is a must, like I said, I showed you earlier that uh, the palate uh, necrosis and the nasal um, ulcers, best to call ENT and let them do a biopsy right away to confirm the diagnosis. Swab is useless because like I said, we are inhaling spores all the time. So if I were to swab all the audience's noses, I'm sure someone will have mucor. It doesn't mean he has mucormycosis and you don't have to treat them. So swab is pretty much useless. Um, and isolation of the fungi in a culture does not necessarily prove infection. Remember I told you that the spores are everywhere in the air, even in microbiology, when the petri dish plates are open, the spores might fall just because something grows in there, it doesn't prove infection. Biopsy, tissue, 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 tissue. Tissue is the definitive diagnosis. You need to get the tissue, mince it, and then you uh, send for uh, growth and look for pathology uh, under uh, microscopy for that. There are some tests called uh, uh, invasive fungal studies. You know, there's one called 1,3-beta-D glucon, uh, also known as fungitel. I know it's available in US. I use it on a daily basis on fungal pa invasion patients uh, for uh, um, chemo transplant patients or chemotherapy patients, uh, but I don't think it's available here uh, readily. I have not seen one. I asked for one on a particular patient for a different reason, but they didn't say they didn't have it. However, this particular test is useless for mucormycosis. This is very good for invasive fungal uh, diseases, for example, coxy, histoblastomycosis, or uh, aspergillosis. Uh, there's another study called aspergillus galactoman in assay. Again, that mucormycosis, it's, all the blood studies are useless. PCR on the histologic specimens has very good yield. So that's another way you can diagnose it. But again, these are all expensive. Cheapest, get a tissue, mince it, send it for pathology and micro, and you will get a diagnosis instantly. Rhino orbital cerebral in, uh, infection, infection uh, when suspected, again, call ENT, do an endoscopic evaluation, look for the tissue necrosis, obtain a biopsy, stain and look for the broad non-septate hyphae with right angle branching. You can get a diagnosis within an hour as soon as long as as soon as you do the biopsy. CT of the sinuses uh, we can do to look for soft tissue edema, bony erosion erosions in the uh, sinuses, and you can do MRI for intracranial, intraorbital, and cavernous sinus involvement. And the particular patient that I worked had uh, 2003, I did an MRI, and his cavernous sinus was thrombosed. By the way, unfortunately, I don't. I lost my. Uh, we used to have that little. Um, Blackberry phones, and I had the MRI on that. Now we don't use it anymore. Uh, I don't have, wish I had that. Um, pulmonary infection, very hard to diagnose, um, difficult to obtain tissue. Uh, first of all, who in their right mind would go and do a bronchoscopy on a COVID patient? Forget about it. No one, no one's going to touch the patient. Furthermore, you know, rest of all, go into a bronch. It's not going to happen. Very difficult to obtain tissue. Um, BAL specimens, uh, if you do a you know, deep lavage and suction out, you may get some broad spectrum non-septate uh, non hypae. Uh, again, 
the diagnosis pretty much depend on radiologic findings. If there's a lot of hemoptysis going on, your chest X-ray shows that ball kind of picture I showed you earlier, and that's your you're depending on that. All the above is like, no, it's just we can in a real world we can, but not really. Treatment. Antifungal therapy in combination of surgical debridement. Just because you give antifungal therapy, it is not going to work. You have to take the patient to the OR and do surgical debridement. It's very difficult. It's easier said than done because the patient is COVID and not a lot of surgeons want to be maybe reluctant to take the patient to the OR. And you know, God bless if they did it, um, kudos to them. And I think some of them actually did that. I heartily congratulate them for taking the risk, but you know that's what being a doctor is about. Um, surgical debridement is the hallmark followed by antifungal therapy. Eliminate predisposing factors um, like hyperglycemia, get the blood sugars under control, metabolic acidosis, push by carb as much as you can, get that pH back to normal. If the patient on defaroxamine, stop it. If the patient on immune suppressive drugs, stop it. If the patient is neutropenic, give granulating stimulating factors like neupogen, get the white cell count up. Uh, the drug of choice here is uh, amphotericin B lipid formulation. That is a drug of choice. A lot of people use amphotericin, regular amphotericin. Uh, unfortunately, amphotericin lipid formation is not available here. Uh, the good old days we used to call amphotericin the amphoterable B, or amphotericin B, because the side effects are horrible. Um, they have, it's, it's intolerable actually, it's very bad. And you give it near to the end, your patient they, it burns and they have nausea, they have severe, they have fevers. It's just not a fun drug to give. That's why it has a nickname called Ampo Terrible B. Um, but if you can find a lipid formulation, um, that's the drug of choice you want to give. New drugs have come in, some called posoconazole or isavuconazole. I have used posoconazole in a few patients when posoconazole just came out into the market. We were the first one to randomize that uh, in our trials uh, and we had a very good uh, success rate. Uh, again, if a patient has a rhinocerebral mucormycosis that involves the orbit, guess what the treatment is? One is enucleation, which is you remove the entire eyeball completely, debride the orbit, if the frontal lobe is involved, you go inside the brain, remove the front part of your brain, you remove the entire turbinates of your nose. And that means the entire side of the face is actually removed. You look like phantom of the opera. It's a horrible disease to survive with. If someone gets it, if I've seen a couple of patients and I said, oh my God, he's better off dying uh, because if he comes out of this, he's gonna sue everybody who did surgery on him because he's gonna hate everybody because it looks horrendous. It looks like the monster. So it is such a bad disease, but some people wanna live even with that. And then they do live and they go severe plastic construction, reconstruction later on in their life to at least give me back a little bit normal so they can wear a prosthetics on the face. Um, but uh, when posaconazole came in, it, helps her, it helped us a lot uh, because the disease did not progress further once the surgery was done. Um, I have not used isavoconazole. It came out more recently and uh, if patient has side effects from amphotericin or amphoterable B, I'm gonna call it, uh, and if they don't respond to the amphoterable B, then they can use posoconazole, isavoconazole. I have, I have used hyperbaric oxygen in some of these patients um, right after surgery because of the tissue necrosis, because it's an angio-invasive fungi, uh, because the tissue is being necrosed, they'll benefit from hyperbarics. If you have hyperbarics in your hospital, that could be of some use. Again, COVID patients, hyperbaric chamber. I don't know who would dare to move that patient over there. I don't know who's daring to do all the surgery. So good luck on that one. Dosing, amphoterable B, lipid formulation, five milligrams per kilo per day or 10 milligrams per kilo per day. It is highly nephrotoxic. And the way I do that treatment is I hydrate these patients with a normal saline, at least a liter, before I even start the amphotericin, I give one liter of normal saline, run it really fast, and then uh, pre-medicate them with Tylenol, um, also paracetamol is called here, and Benadryl, which is diphenhydramine. So we 
pre-medicate 30 minutes before we start the amphoterapy uh, drip. Um, I'm saying, I'm so used to calling amphoterapy the amphotericin B drip. Uh, duration, duration is given until the patient shows signs of improvement. And then once they start showing the surgery is done and the chance of improvement are there, then you can step down, de-escalate the therapy with the oral posoconazole. Uh, oral posoconazole can be given 300 milligrams Q12 hours on day one, and then 300 milligrams uh, daily after that, once a day after that. You have to take it with good fatty food. The food has to contain fat. Um, then we check levels of the, uh, the posoconazole in about a week uh, or 15 days, and we always uh, keep the trough level more than one MCG per ml. Uh, again, this is all very costly. Um, first, if the patient survives, God, you know, and then we, we can do all these things. The isavaconazole um, is 200 milligram tablets every eight hours for six days, and then you can just give them 200 milligrams once a day. Again, I don't know if it's available in this country, uh, but I have personally used posoconazole. Uh, I have used the tablet form and I use the liquid form. Uh, liquid forms are for patients who just cannot swallow for whatever reason. Outcomes. Outcomes, the prognosis is poor. Um, rhino orbital cerebral infarction. Uh, mortality ranges between 25 to 62. Uh, pulmonary mucormycosis. Mortality is 87%. If the carotid artery is involved, then he's gone for sure. Uh, that is the last of my slides and I will stop here. And uh, I think we have some time to take questions. Yes, over to Rupashri to take up questions. Rupashri, Dr. Rupashri. Dr. Rupashri. Dr. Rupashri. One minute, sir. One minute. Ah. Hello, pa. Rupashri, sir. Huh? She is there, sir. One minute. Ah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Okay, ma. Sorry for the technical error. Yeah. Okay. I was uh, not able to unmute myself. Hmm. Okay, so good afternoon to one and all, and uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mahesh Kotapalli, sir, for presenting a talk on management of uh, mucormycosis. So, with your uh, permission, I would like to take some questions in the chat box. So, from Nikita, if a patient is allergic to amphotericin B, then what would be the drug of choice in this condition? I just showed my last slide, um, the fosoconazole. And isuvaconazole are the two choices available. Okay. Uh, okay, sir. So uh, you said in your talk, steam inhalation would be one of the uh, cause for this mucormycosis. Even at the home, it has become very much uh, uh, what you know, famous to take a steam emulation. <laughs> so everybody wants to take the steam emulation. If they want to take the steam emulation, what can be the precautions which they can follow to avoid this condition? I didn't understand your question. You said if they want to take the steam inhalation, what precautions to take? Yes, sir. Yes, right. Again, you know, studies haven't proven anything that steam inhalation does anything. Sure. You know, it's a steam inhalation usually opens up your sinuses. Uh, once in a while, especially if your sinuses are blocked uh, due to some kind of common cold or some allergic reaction. But other than that, studies have been shown that, you know, steam inhalation prevents COVID. Again, this is all WhatsApp speculation. There is no proven data. All I can say is the more inhaled steam is done, the more damage you're doing to your uh, mucosa and your cilia, and you're actually making yourself prone uh, to other conditions. So I personally, I do not recommend it. Right. right. Okay. So uh, Dr. Seema, she wants to ask, please give your opinion on retrobulbar injection of amphotericin B. Retrobulbar injection of amphotericin B. Um, again, 
you I'm assuming this patient has a rhinocerebral mucormycosis that has spread to the orbital area and you want to save the eye. Uh, my okay. suggestion is if it's already invaded the eye, the amphotericin giving over there is not going to cut the cheese. No, it's not going to work. You have to get your ophthalmologist involved and you will have to go in and have an enucleation done if you want to save the patient. The orbit has to be explored and debrided. Um, local amphotericin B injections, it's just a myth. It doesn't work like that. Right. So we have a hand raise option. Uh, please ask them to unmute themselves and ask the question. Gautam? Yes, yes, madam. Done, madam. Sir, please ask your question, sir. Yeah. Yeah, good afternoon, sir. I am Dr. Shashi, the medical oncologist. So, first Hi, of all, uh, yes, sir, thank you for the wonderful talk. It was very informative. Just wanted to know, like, because for us as a medical oncologist in ALL patient, we have seen few mucormycosis and the dose of steroids, whatever we use in acute lymphoblastic leukemia, is quite high than what is being used in COVID. So just wanted to know, sir, like uh, why the incidence of mucor is so high in COVID, whereas if it is only related to steroid, then we should have seen more mucor mycosis in ALLs or in other indications, connective tissue disorders where more of steroid is used. So would like to know your thoughts on this. That's a very interesting question. Why you don't see it in before and why are we seeing it now? And my, my spec, my, it's a speculation again, the word I'm, I'm, I'm taking a disclaimer, it's a speculation. My speculation is for some reason, COVID causes more elevated uh, ferritin levels in the blood. And maybe in combination of steroids and high iron loads uh, and uncontrolled blood sugars. Um, if you're, uh, and again, I, I'm not having enough data to say that the mucor that is happening in the COVID patients, are these all diabetics or non-diabetics? Some of them said they were not diabetic. Some of them are diabetic. So whom do we believe? You get all kinds of crap on WhatsApp. So there is no data and no one actually took the time to actually sit down and evaluate these cases. Have, uh, Dr. Shester, have you seen a mucor case so far? In the ALL patients, we have seen sir, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So you but, actually have seen a patient with mucormycosis. It's very rare you see that. If you do see that, well, uh, congratulations, because you've seen one. I've seen one. That was my only thing. I've never seen anything after that. Uh, but your ALL patients, mostly maybe not diabetic. And no, these sir, patients... Please. Yeah, they're kids, so you know they're not diabetic. Here, you're seeing mucor in COVID patients. Maybe they're diabetic and they're on steroids and the sugars are not being monitored. And most importantly, respiratory acidosis, the pH. The pH is not being monitored because you have to do ABGs on these patients. And how many people actually do ABGs in the hospitals here? It's expensive. It's 300 of what is $500 rupees uh, for one ABG report. But if you have to do four of them a day, every day on a vented patient, it's gonna be very expensive. So I don't know, but ideally, and I'm just comparing what we have in United States to here is because there we have an A-line, arterial line on this patient. And every hour or every two hours, every three hours, we have a machine sitting there. We, we, have, the, we have the luxury of doing ABGs constantly. Uh, to check the pH on these patients and we're giving tons and tons of bicarb to these patients to correct their acidosis. That could be one of the reasons. I, I'm Again, I'm speculating. I don't have enough data to say this way or that way, but I'm comparing why we don't have it here, why we have it here. I think these are the possible reasons. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Thanks, sir. Right, sir. So, okay, sir. So, my question is, is there any uh, uh, correlation between the like, you know, the number of uh, days the person has been affected COVID and uh, the chances of getting mucormycosis. Like how many days of COVID I don't, infection? No, there is, yeah. uh, again, there is no data uh, or studies to show which were the other. So I'm not an expert on research. Um, so again, speculation. I don't think there is any data to say if you have COVID for 18 days, you get mucor, you get no. I think it's just a nonsense way to think about it. I don't even think we should think about that thing. 
The only thing we should think about right now is if the patient is having COVID, is he immune? -sized? Are you giving steroids like prednisone as outpatient in the clinics? You're prescribing steroids. If you're prescribing steroids, are you also telling your patients to control the blood sugars to the T very carefully? Uh, uh, and, and, and in the hospital, if they're in respiratory acidosis, are you correcting the acid base? So these are the ones I would look at. I don't, I don't think there's an answer to say, if you have 10 days of COVID, you will get mucor or 20 days of COVID. Right, right, sir. So in relation to, uh, to this only, Dr. Tasneem, she wants to know, is it possible to develop mucomycosis in patients who are not having comorbid conditions of diabetes, but uh, they might have raised uh, glucose level in blood due to steroids? While exactly. What, what, is, what, is, what, is, what is steroid? It's called artificial diabetes, okay. temporary artificial diabetes. And there are some patients who went into permanent diabetes after use of long steroids. So yes, if your sugars are elevated, you are prone to it. It could be from diabetes, it could be from steroids, it could be from drinking, having a, a glucose drip continuously going on. It could be 101 reasons for that. Okay, so another question, very specific question. So uh, I'll just, so, okay. If the mucor has reached the orbit, uh, what should be the uh, choice of surgery? Is it enucleation or uh, excentration? It depends on the surgeon, okay. depending on how much damage there is and what he finds when he goes inside, then he has to make that decision. There is no such thing as you do this or that. Uh, Gautam, do we have any other hand raise options? Uh, no, madam. <clears throat> There's one question said, would caspofungin be used in the di in the diagnosis? No, caspofungin doesn't work. It doesn't work. Okay. Okay, sir. So uh, during the talk, you said- uh, Okay, lipid. and there's I... another question. I'm sorry. What should be the line of treatment if only oral lesions are seen? Palate, Palate usually is, the uh, oral finding. Again, surgical debridement and amphotericin B. Okay, right. So the role of lipid diet, sir, can you stress more upon that? By Lip taking lipid, lipid diet, diet, you said, yeah. Oh, postoconazole, the, the, the oral mm -hmm. medications, it gets absorbed. Remember the, the vitamins we have with the fat soluble vitamins and water soluble vitamins. The fat soluble vitamins are A, D, E, K, and mm -hmm. the rest of them are water soluble. So when you say patient, hey, take vitamin A or vitamin D, uh, you take it with food because in our food, Invariably, there's some fat, either in the form of ghee or in the form of oil or chicken, mutton, that's all fat. So that's why I'm saying eat fatty food. Fatty food means more of little extra ghee or, or some good yogurt or chicken or whatever, whichever has a little bit more fat. So if you just take pure vegetarian food, the absorption might not be there. Because any of the medical condition, they stress upon more of salads and uh, such kind of a diet. So this is uh, no, this, no, this is this this is more this is more of absorption. -y. Like a lot of people give uh, vitamin D. Uh, it's become a trend in U.S. Right? Every patient gets in the, the regular physician does vitamin D every three months because Indians in general don't like to go in the sun because we are dark already, and you go into the sun, you become more dark, and you end up using more fair and lovely. So you don't want to buy fair and lovely. So you don't want to go into the sun. Therefore, you avoid the sun. Therefore, your vitamin D levels in general are low in all Indians. And then you say take vitamin D, but people don't tell them that, hey, when you take vitamin D, take it with your dinner. Because dinner is the most heaviest meal in general we all eat. We eat breakfast while running, you know, a couple of at least stand in the one corner and stand idly or lunchtime we're running somewhere. Dinner is the proper meal that we actually sit down and eat a good heavy meal. So that's why you should always, when you're giving fat soluble medications, always say, take it with dinner time. Here in postoconazole, initially you're giving to, uh, first day, it's just twice a day. After that is the day you can say, take it with dinner after having a nice happy fatty meal. Okay, so Dr. Shashidhar Karpu, please uh, unmute yourself and ask the question. Dr. 
डॉक्टर शशिधर या आज क्यों क्वेश्चन सर या आई वास इट ऑलरेडी मैम ओके थैंक यू आई हैव वन क्वेश्चन ऑन द ग्रुप मोहम्मद जे या इफेक्ट ऑफ जिंक ओवर यूज ऑन इंक्रीज रिस्क ऑफ म्यूकरमाइकोसिस आई हैव बीन यूजिंग जिंक लाइक Water, sir, in US, and I have not seen a mucormycosis. I don't think it's zinc. It mostly um, the elevated levels of ferritin is what my speculation is. So we have an Andrew's option from Dr. Mohammed. Please unmute yourself and ask the question. Good afternoon, madam. Good afternoon, sir. Sir, is it a question? So when the patient are suffering from the COVID pneumonia. Up to a level of 19 score after carrying the CT scan, either the patient has to be kept in the home, and we have to start the treatment. They should go for directly to the hospitalized, because so many patients are died when the score should be of 19. What is the best treatment regarding these cases? What decision we have to take for these such type of the cases? This is my regarding the question, madam. Um, is breaking. Is he saying that? From what I'm understanding, he's saying the high high resolution CT score is high. Should be kept in the home or hospital. I'll, yeah. I'll read out it, sir. Yes. If a patient is suffering from COVID pneumonia with a high score of uh, CT 19, around 19, whether the patient has to hospitalize or the treatment can be done at home. Okay. Is it your I, question, we, sir? Okay, with all due respect, sir, um, the whole concept of a CT score is a big scam. It's a big sham. Yeah. Is. Nowhere in the world it is used except in India and Dutch. This is a mm -hmm. Dutch scoring system. Somehow it percolated into our Indian society, and people are like giving scores, are uh, like, oh, I have eighty percent, I have eighteen, I have nineteen, as if you know, this is how we used to do in medical school. Thirty-two percent was our pass mark when we were in medical school, medical college here. So now it's like 18 out of 30 is like more than 60 percent. The more the score they get, the more higher they get. And I have seen patients coming into admitting into the hospital, no oxygen, nothing. They're on the laptop playing around. I said, "Why did you get admitted? My CT score was 18. My doctor said go get admitted. I said get out. You don't need admission. Go home. You should never admit anybody or treat anybody based on the goddamn CT scan score. It's bull crap. It is just bogus." it's a big scam treat the patient symptomatically if the patient has no fever no shortness of breath nothing why are we chasing with the ct scan score and scaring them admitting into the hospital the only thing you need to tell a patient is stay home isolate yourself take tylenol monitor your oxygen levels buy a oxygen monitor a finger oxygen monitor costs like 2 300 rupees or 400 rupees put it on if your oxygen drops below 90 then go to the hospital as long as it's above 90 and you're fine breathing okay stay home thank you sir thank you sir right sir one more question sir yeah that is the patient is suffering from yeah, that is gd distress especially in the covid after getting a rt pcr positive uh, they have a continuous loose motion continuous loose motion up to a 5 days 6 days even though the patient should be fast one month also she is having a one or two motions also but there is no symptomatic any others involvement of the lungs nothing she is what she is okay but still two or three motions has going on so no, regarding this diarrhea is one of the hallmark for covid some patients have it some patients don't um Again, if you're having diarrhea, just hydrate you. <laughs> take some emodium or loperamide uh, to control the symptoms. Um, now, here's one thing I noticed: is everybody gets antibiotics. You have COVID, you get Zithromax. You have COVID, you get doxycycline. You have COVID, you get something else. Some antibiotic is given to these patients, and only thing is, what if they develop C diff colitis from all this antibiotic over usage? so after after so many days if a patient is persistently having diarrhea then we need to start looking outside the box maybe this is not covid related maybe the patient actually developed some other 
uh, issue from this overuse of antibiotics yeah. such Clostridium difficile colitis. So you need to send yeah. the stool for C. diff toxin by PCR yeah. and make sure that that, that, that hasn't carried in. So um, I have not seen COVID causing diarrhea for a month. There's something else going on. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Right, sir. So, our next question is from uh, Smita. She wants your, uh, I know, opinion on, I mean, or the message to nurses who are handling the these mucormycosis cases. Mucormycosis is, is not something that you should be afraid as it's contagious. I just told you that it's like God, is everywhere. Right. So just don't worry about it. Don't think about it. Just move on with your lives and don't, don't be paranoid. We have enough paranoia going on in our lives. So you're already having a mask for your COVID. What else are you going to do? Put a second mask and a third mask? It doesn't work like that. So don't worry about it. Unless you're immune suppressed or your, your diabetes is under control. So no, we don't even think about it. Right, right. Uh, do we have any other hand raise option? No, madam. So I think uh, with this, we have uh, come to the end of the session. Thank you so much, sir, for answering all the questions. Over to you, Diana, sir. Oh, uh, uh, yeah. Before my word of thanks, uh, Dr. Rupashree, right. you tell me, you tell all the participants about our uh, next program. Next program. Yes, sir. Right. Gautam, uh, is flyer available? Madam, yes, okay. I shared So, yeah, so to inform all the participants, like uh, we have continuing with the same uh, series of online uh, training uh, or education for COVID-19, RGHS Echo India. So on June 15th, Tuesday at 3 p.m., we have uh, a, a talk on public health challenges and preparedness for COVID third wave. The speakers are Dr. B.S. Pradeep, uh, Professor and HOD, Epidemiology, Nimhans, Bangalore. Dr. Lalita, Professor and Head, Community Medicine, MS, uh, Ramaya, College of, uh, uh, Medi Ramaya Medical College, Bangalore. And we have uh, Dr. B.S. Nandakumar, uh, Community Medicine Associate Professor from uh, Ramaya Medical College, Bangalore. So I request uh, everybody to join this uh, session on uh, 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 June 15th, Tuesday at 3 p.m. Thank you so much. Over to Thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Rupashri. Yeah, now it is my responsibility to deliver the vote of thanks. On behalf of the Vice Chancellor and Register of Raju Gandhi University of Health Sciences, I thank the today's speaker, Dr. Mahesh Kottapalli. Sir, you made all the today, there were about 370 participants. You made all of them understand about the management of mucor mycosis. On behalf of our registrar and uh, vice chancellor, I thank you very much, sir. And then I thank the ECHO India for their cooperation to conduct this webinar. And then I thank all the in-house officers, Dr. B.J. Mahindra, Dr. Rupa Shri, and Kirti Somshekar for their cooperation. And I thank all the participants who participated in this uh, program. Thank you. Thank you one and all. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. You all have a good evening. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Mahesh. Thank you very much. Thank you. Welcome. You can end the session. Okay, ma'am. Thank you.